It's one of the few tech unicorns founded by a female entrepreneur. Katrina Lake started by styling friends, family, and classmates, packing boxes of clothes, then mailing them to her new customers. Those customers kept coming back and multiplying. But after initial early stage investment, some 50 venture capitalists turned her down. That was a mistake. In 2017, Stitch Fix went public, now at a $2.5 billion valuation, and has expanded to new categories, including not just women, but also men, plus-sized, maternity, and kids. Lake became the first woman founder-CEO to take an internet company public in years. Joining me today on Bloomberg Studio 1.0, Stitch Fix founder and CEO, Katrina Lake. Katrina, I'm so glad to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. You have helped millions of customers discover their own sense of style, first women, then men, everyone now from plus-sized to pregnant. What is the number one mission of Stitch Fix, the business today? The thing that we all love about being part of this business is that every day we get to help 2.5 million men and women everywhere look and feel their best. Um, and what we're doing is we're bringing this luxury of personal shopping and making it democratic, making it accessible, um, making it so that anybody, any place in the country um, can let us know what their size and style preferences are and have a stylist make selections for them. So how many boxes are you sending out? each month, how many stylists you have curating those boxes? So we have over 3,000 stylists. Our stylists are all over the country. They're employees of Stitch Fix. Um, they are trained by us. Um, and our stylists uh, mostly work part-time, and so there's some flexibility in around how many clients they're serving. Um, but overall, the most recent number we've shared is that we're styling 2.5 million clients. Growing up, you were the kid wearing raver boots and Jenko jeans, and I want to know how you sort of discovered your own iconoclastic sense of style. You know, what was it like growing up Katrina Lake? I grew up in a kind of multicultural, bi bilingual, bicultural household. My mom is from Japan and my dad um, is an American. And um, that always kind of introduced just like a lot of cultural curiosity and, um, you know, a sense of, um, I don't know, a sense of adventure and exploration and learning. And, um, and in my household, uh, my younger sister actually was really the fashionista of the family. She would wear like purple sequin, whatever, and she, um, she was definitely the one that was more about pushing the limits of fashion. Neon um, raver boots aren't pushing the limits. <laughs> um, but it, you know, it just, it made it so that it was a way to be able to express your identity and to um, experiment with your style and who you, who you are. And, um, and I think that kind of fun part of trying to understand your style is, is a big part of what Stitch Fix is now. Actually, your grandmother had a really big influence on you. My Japanese grandmother was, she was born and raised in Japan at a time that um, women didn't have a ton of opportunity. She was, she was in an arranged marriage. Um, she had two daughters, my mom and her sister. And um, she, she felt this great obligation with the two daughters that she had to really set them up for the lives that she would have wanted for herself. And decades later, um, my mom and her sister would both move here and be Americans and, um, and my grandmother would follow suit. Um, and it was just a, this amazing inspiration of somebody who wasn't necessarily given a lot of opportunity in kind of the circumstances in which she was born. Um, and to set these bold aspirational goals for yourself and achieve them. So you ended up at Stanford, you majored in economics, and this was about the same time that Mark Zuckerberg was on campus going to Stanford parties. In that time, did you ever think that you could do what he was doing? It was not even close to on my radar at that point. I think of my path into entrepreneurship as a very kind of wandering one, and, um, and I think I had a preconceived notion of what a founder, especially a founder of a tech company, looked like. Um, and so it, it truly wasn't even visible to me as a career path at that point. So what was it that flipped the switch? I was really inspired by the opportunity to transform retail. And I looked at retail and thought, there's so many different ways you can incorporate data and technology and data science into the way that retail works. And 
And I didn't feel like um, I saw companies that were really doing that. And so at first, I was actually on a journey to find that company. And at first, it was looking at pre-existing retailers and seeing which one did I think would win. And then it was actually working at a VC and um, meeting hundreds of founders to try to find a founder I could join. And then ultimately, what I realized was if I thought there was this opportunity to transform retail and do it in a totally different way that I could find found that company myself. Ultimately, you went to Harvard for your MBA, and that's where you started Stitch Fix. You sent the first Stitch Fix from your Cambridge apartment in 2011. How did you get there? I had this thesis around retail has to change. Stores are closing. Um, today's version of how people buy clothes is not convenient. It's not sustainable. When I realized that I wanted to start my own company, I felt like going to business school was a risk-reduced way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I was not somebody that was going to just quit my job and work out of my garage and have a gap on my resume. And my goal with the whole thing was I want to get funded, be paying myself a salary, be paying back my student loans the day I graduate. And if I can do that, then I can find entrepreneurship as kind of a tenable path for me. And if I wasn't able to do that, then I would have an MBA from Harvard and lots of opportunities. So you had a co-founder, Aaron Morrison Flynn, you guys bought a ton of clothes on your credit cards, right? A lot of the testing and trying I did, you know, with my own credit card and my own finances. But um, but this was a business that very early on, we were lucky enough to have Steve Anderson, who was an angel investor who believed in the company, who put in money. So luckily, I didn't have to try to, you know, kind of expand my credit limit too much then. What was it early on that made you realize this can work? In the early stage of this company, we grew incredibly rapidly all organically. That product market fit of this is something that women everywhere really gravitate towards of like, I don't have time, I don't want to spend my days at the mall, I don't want to cull through hundreds of things online, and I can find clothes that I love in a way that's personalized and convenient. Um, the value proposition of that was so strong that, um, that the early growth was just kind of a, a testament and manifestation of that. Now, it wasn't obvious to everyone, unfortunately. In fact, there were dozens of investors who said no. I think people had a hard time getting passionate about it, wrapping their head around it. I think there were some questions around, um, you know, can this be a billion dollar business or not? We've done a billion dollars in the last 12 months now. And we were looking at the data and we had clients all over the country in states that I'd never been to and states where I knew nobody. So we felt like we had the data to support that this is a broad concept that has, um, you know, that has broad appeal. But it was really hard. And I think there are a lot of venture investors that just didn't feel super passionate about it and, um, you know, just kind of couldn't get there. And, you know, that was hard. How much of that do you think is because you're a woman pitching mostly male investors about a product that was initially focused on women and they didn't get it? I think that definitely has a lot to do with the element of somebody being passionate about it. And um, I appreciate, you know, I had venture investors that were like, I want to be passionate about all the companies that I invest in and I want to feel like, you know, I'm living and breathing it and I can add value to you and that I just can't get there with women's clothes. And there's part of that that, like, I can't disagree with them. I also want them to feel passionate. And at the same time, um, at the time, 94% of venture investors were men. And so there's you know, just some natural bias that, that kind of gets introduced, I think, when you have such a homogenous group of people. Ultimately, you did get interest from one of the most successful investors in Silicon Valley history thus far, Bill Gurley, who also invested in Uber, and I think he has his own assistant to thank uh, because she became uh, addicted to Stitch Fix. Yes, Amy, who um, is his assistant, um, and many of her friends and people in the benchmark office um, all love Stitch Fix. And so he he was just curious, and he's like, I have to understand what this company is doing. We weren't actually actively looking for money at the time, but as I got to know him, it was really clear that he he would add a lot of value, and it's been amazing for my development. It's been it's helped the company take massive steps changes in the way that we operate and um, you know, we've been very lucky to work with him. Now you and your co-founder eventually parted ways and you've become the sole face of the company. Yeah so my co-founder and I parted ways um, about 
a year and a half in or so. Very fortunately, in the summer of 2012, I also was able to recruit the COO of Walmart.com, Mike Smith, who joined our team, who's still on our team and is still our COO. And also Eric Colson, who came from Netflix, um, where he ran data science there. And so there's been a lot of continuity in the leadership of the, of the team. Was it hard sort of breaking up with your co-founder, essentially? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's, I think it's, you know, some of the hardest stuff that founders go through. Mm -hmm. You get to a place where you see things through a different light and you see the world through two different lenses and like they don't meet. And it was really hard. Um, and at the same time, being able to have Mike and Eric who joined the team around that time and who have now been with the company for five years. They were mentors in a lot of ways to me. I had never done this before. I feel very fortunate to have a team that um, many pe there's many people at Stitch Fix who've been at the company for a long time. And, um, and I think, you know, in particular, to be able to have a leadership team that's had a lot of continuity is something that um, helped us uh, as we looked at milestones, as we grew and scaled, and ultimately as we thought about becoming a public company. This has a 72% chance of working. This has a 38% chance of working. And that data is presented to the stylist. Stitch Fix was profitable two years before you went public. Was that a priority for you? Was that a choice? We live in an interesting time where um, I think companies are rewarded for growth. And, and look, our business has been growing at around 25% year over year the last four quarters. But I think companies are rewarded more for growth than for profitability. And, and so there's not a lot of public pressure, I think, for companies to get profitable. And so, um, look, I understand <laughs> the decisions that many others are making. At the same time, that wasn't necessarily a choice that we had. Um, so we, our first quarter of profitability was in 2014. And and this was a business that was really, really hard to raise money for. Personally, our company is better because of it. In 2017, Stitch Fix went public at a $1.5 billion valuation. You're also the youngest female founder to take a company public. How did that feel? The whole public offering process was rocky for us as a company. It wasn't kind of I don't know, as smooth as you might want it to be in a perfect world. But at the end of the day, I think it, you know, it, it didn't really matter. And I think this is a company that's been underestimated before, and we're happy to prove ourselves in the public market. And that day of being able to kind of celebrate and remember the journey that we were on was, um, it was, it was an incredible day. And it was an incredible day to be able to share with all of our clients and our employees and our investors and um, the people who have had such meaningful impact on how we got to where we are. But it definitely was, you know, it was a day I'll never forget. What's it like on the other side, post IPO? Is it easier, is it harder? It's different. Um, and I mean, I think about in my job, in the seven years that I've been doing this, every year I, I think of myself as rehiring myself in a new job and committing to that new job. Um, it's every year has been so different than the years past. There is there were years when my job was literally like making sure that everybody's in line, getting fixes out the door so that our fixes would arrive to clients on time, and like that was the most important thing that I was doing in 2012. So what's your job um, this year? I now have not just our private market investors, but also public market investors that we're building trust with and that we're spending time with and earning the trust of. You know, there's some small things that change, but I think the heart and soul of the company hasn't changed, and in the ways that it's different, I think it's made us better. Um, I think we look at our financials with more rigor than we did before. I think at the end of the day, like we, we're, we are focused on making sure that we build lots of long-term value for our shareholders, which includes our new shareholders. It also includes employees. And, um, and I think we feel a lot of responsibility for that. How big is your potential market and why? The apparel market is like a $300 billion market that's growing. You hear a lot about the death of retail, but it's actually retailers that are struggling. And so we have this amazing tailwind of um, kind of both consumer behavior and um, stores closing and kind of what's going on in the macro environment. There are two big things that we did, which is the launch of men's and the launch of plus size. And both of those like literally doubled the number of bodies we can address. The state of physical retail is dismal. Look at Nordstrom, look at The Gap. Does that turn around? I always think there'll be a place for physical retail. I think um, that it's a great place to experience a brand. But I think the idea that a, a 
brand would have hundreds of stores or thousands of stores across the U.S., I think that's just going to be really hard. I think the, the natural preference of consumers is they want to transact online. And so I think stores just have to have like a different reason for being. Everyone seems to be worried about Amazon, um, you know, no matter what business you're in. Do you worry about the threat of Amazon? They have very suc successful subscription businesses now. They haven't done it in apparel yet. What's stopping them? It's a very different ballgame in apparel. Um, Amazon is amazing if you want to get something cheap and fast delivered to your home. The reality is in apparel, there's much more nuance. Having millions of pairs of jeans to choose from isn't actually that helpful if what all you're looking for is jeans that are going to fit your body well. We absolutely keep an eye, but at the same time, I think we feel a lot of confidence and strength in our capabilities and our focus on the discovery element, and that you know that's a little bit of a different business, I think, than um, what, we'll, what we're seeing most e-commerce in today. Would you ever sell to an Amazon? Would you ever sell to a, a larger retail giant? I think it's clear we've chosen an independent path. So, um, you know, as we've thought about what are all of the outcomes that are potentially available to us, um, you know, we, we have a deep belief and still do that this is a company that deserves to be an independent, publicly traded company, and there's still tons of market opportunity ahead, and so we're very focused on the independent path. There are a lot of other companies trying to do what you do, other subscription services, whether it is Daily Look, Alumay, Gwenny B. First and foremost, what differentiates our business is, is you know, it's not kind of the subscription tag. I mean, there's the business is one that you can do monthly. You can also do it a la carte. And and quite frankly, you know, people are not paying the same amount every month as you would in a normal subscription business. The way we look at it is we're in the business of personalization. We do one-to-one, human-to-human personalization scalably. How real is the data and AI platform at Stitch Fix? How valuable is it? It is so real and incredibly valuable. So there are a lot of buzzy terms around big data. What we're doing is actually high signal um, data that people are actively sharing with us um, that is um, pertains exactly to the experience that they're having. And so people will try things on, try five things on, they'll let us know, these were too big, these are too small, this was too expensive, I love this but I already have it, um, I love it in a different color. Um, these are just the things that people naturally are sharing with us to help us to understand what they're liking and not liking about the product. So 100% of the time, because of the data that we have, we know who buys what. So we know a 25-year-old um, woman in Louisiana bought these jeans. Um, 85% of the time, we actually know why. And so she's letting us know these are too expensive, this is too cheap, I love this, um, I love the way this fit on my body. And that, the both the breadth and the um, kind of like depth of that data is incredibly valuable. So if you have all this data, do you need all those stylists ultimately? Or do those stylists go away? So no, the stylists serve a very important part. And so what that data allows us to do is it allows us to be able to, under to um, have a predictive ability on clothes and people and what's gonna happen. And so we are very able to highly, highly accurately predict this has a 72% chance of working, this has a 38% chance of working, and that data is presented to the stylist. So the stylist is part of the selection process and also part of the relationship building of explaining to you why she chose things and really building that relationship in a one-to-one -one human way. One thing that I see a lot of founders do that is part of the problem is that they hire their friends and the people they've worked with. As the youngest female founder to take a company public and one of the few running a unicorn, do you feel a greater sense of pressure or responsibility to pave the way for other women than you did when you started this journey? I do feel a great responsibility. You know, there was a time a few years ago where I was just more averse, I think, to being like a female founder or a female CEO. Um, and you know, the reality is that um, it, that the world needs it now. And um, and I, you know, I think about myself when I was writing my business school applications or when I was um, kind of figuring out who I wanted to be in the world. I'm really proud that I can be an example of um, a different kind of tech CEO, a different kind of. IPO CEO. I treat that responsibility, I think, very, um, it's, it's very important to me. You recently wrote a tweet, which I loved, about the iPhone auto suggesting a white male emoticon for the word CEO, saying, I don't look like this, I look like this. But you have an incredible power now to speak up. How do you use that power? How do you decide when to use that power? 
my powers are best deployed at Stitch Fix. The biggest impact that I can have is by creating a company that has an amazing culture that people love to work at, that people love to get fixes from and be a client of. You didn't always feel like you had the power. In the introduction to my book, you talk about how you heard Chris Saka, the investor, bragging about his hot tub parties at a conference where you know entrepreneurs like Travis Kalanick, uh, the founder of Uber, would congregate. You know, talk to me about like how you navigated that kind of thing in in the early days. I was exposed to bias, both I think kind of deliberate and not deliberate. And you know, I hope those days are far behind us now. And um, you know, I think there's a much greater awareness now of you know what I think back then could have been seen in a tone deaf way is like, oh, just like another way to connect with entrepreneurs that I think today that people, um, I think people recognize that um, being inclusive and having a diverse portfolio, having a diverse employee base, like these are things that are good for business and that people are making the right decisions about. You reportedly even told Bill Gurley during the Uber drama that he had a greater responsibility to sort of fix what was going on and to rein it in there. You know, how do you decide when to press those buttons? I have a great relationship with Bill, and um, and I, you know, I, I feel like he's somebody that is happy to listen to my very direct opinions, merely opinions about um, about what I was seeing, and I have so much respect for Bill and Benchmark and. It was a series of really difficult decisions that they have made in the last year, last two years. And you know, I appreciate Bill for his openness and listening to, to my kind of direct opinions. You had your own Me Too problem with the investor Justin Kaltbeck, who was accused by multiple women, many of them entrepreneurs of sexual harassment and even assault. And I know that legally you can't discuss it which is part of Silicon Valley's problem, um, forcing people to sign NDAs so that these stories never get told. But what is your reaction to the broader stories that have been told by women in Silicon Valley, in Hollywood, in Washington? The last year has like undoubtedly been like a big moment of change. And I think, you know, there's a lot that has led up to this. And um, in many cases, there were decades of behavior that are now coming out in this last year. Um, and I, I think to me, I'm more excited about kind of looking ahead. And I think in particular, Founders for Change and Moving Forward are two initiatives that um, I think are really exciting. And Moving Forward, for example, is one that allows people to be able to see the sexual harassment and discrimination policies of VCs and also have a point of contact. And that's something that um, is a step change from where we were in the past. And Founders for Change involves founders agreeing to consider the diversity of a firm when they are deciding whether to take that exactly. check. Do they have women or people of color who can actually write and checks? And importantly, also says like, hey, I am a founder for change and I'm going to build an inclusive team. And so mm -hmm. it's saying the founder is taking responsibility for their team and their company and then also asking of that from the VC. And I mean, this is a massively different environment. People are having the right conversations. There's There are real protective measures that are in place. And I think of, I reflect on the experience that I had founding a company and, um, this is a much better environment to do it. Like I think about what it would be like today and I think it's a lot better. So I'm, I'm really optimistic. You are building an incredibly diverse team at Stitch Fix. You took your full maternity leave and I know that was really important of you to do that and send that as a signal to your employees. Talk to me about how you build that team and what other founders can, can learn from you because everybody wants to know, how do I do this? I think one thing that I see a lot of founders do that is part of the problem is that they hire their friends and the people they've worked with. Being able to have a wide lens for all of the hires that you're making and feeling like you're actually looking at the whole kind of the broader context and saying, is this the best person for the job? Like that's actually been my secret to building a diverse team. I know you're really passionate about helping other women find their confidence to, to do now what you have done. What is your advice to those entrepreneurs, especially women entrepreneurs who are looking at you and saying, how do I do that today? I mean, I think firstly, it's just like surround yourself with possibility and to try it, do it, experiment. Like, um, you know, I, I believe in, you know, so much more possibility now than, um, you know, I've, I've gained so much over the years and um, I'm excited to see many more women take the plunge. All right. Katrina Lake, CEO of Stitch Fix, thank you so much for joining us. Thank really you. great to have you.